Good morning and welcome. I'm Dennis McGee and I'm one of the elders here at Heritage. I'd like to welcome you to our Sunday service. And if you'd like to pray with me, uh, there's a couple of passages that have struck me recently. Uh, the first is in Romans 15, uh, where God calls himself the God of hope. And he's the giver of encouragement and the giver of hope and perseverance. And the second passage is in 1 Samuel, where Hannah is praying, and she prays to God out of her great anguish, out of her great need and great distress. And she states, I have poured out my soul before the Lord. And that's what God wants from us, those two things, to pour out our soul to Him and for us to look to Him for encouragement and perseverance. So, Father, we praise You for Your faithfulness. We praise You for Your compassion. We praise You for Your strength. Thank You for Your love for each one of us. Lord, we want to lift up to those in our fellowship who may have recently lost their jobs. We pray that You would provide for them and we pray for their peace. Lord, we pray for those around the world who are suffering from this virus or who are mourning the loss of a loved one. We ask for your grace on them, for their comfort, your strength. Lord, we pray for the first responders and the health professionals and the hospital workers. We pray that you would grant them stamina and strength and protection. We pray for our leaders. We pray for President Trump Vice President Pence, we pray for our governor and all their respective teams. We ask that you would grant them wisdom and endurance. And most of all, we want to acknowledge the great spiritual battle that we're in. We ask that your Holy Spirit do a mighty work across our land. We pray that you would draw men, women, and children into your kingdom. And we pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to opportunities to be an encouragement to meet a need or to share your word. In all these things, we put our trust in you. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, at this time, I'd like to invite you to go ahead and hit the pause button. And if you'd care to spend a moment or two casting your burdens upon the Lord, whether you're by yourself or with your family. Uh, and as Hannah did, and she's going through her moments of anguish, that you would go ahead and cast that upon the Lord and then thank Him that He wants to carry those burdens for us. Go ahead and hit the pause button now. Thank you. Amen. He is the God of hope. Let's continue in worship, praising Christ as the solid rock. <laughs> built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand Covenant his blood, support me in the whelming flood. And all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Yes. 
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him again be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Sand. On Christ a solid rock I stand, all the other ground is sinking sand, all the other ground is sinking sand. We stand only in His righteousness, not our own. Scripture tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. But how often do we come before the Lord in prayer and fail to mention our sin? We ask him to deliver us from our circumstances. We cry out to him, but we fail to acknowledge our own waywardness. Well, David was in such a situation in Psalm 32. He says, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. This next song outlines the appropriate cry of the redeemed. Lord, have mercy. For what we have done and left undone, we fall on your countless mercies for sins that are known and those unknown. We call on your name so holy For envy and pride For closing our eyes For scorning our very neighbor In thought, word, and deed We failed you, our King How deeply we need a Savior Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy, Christ. 
control for scorning our very maker. In thought, word, and deed, we failed you, our King. How deeply we need a Savior. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy,
and loving Savior. You amaze us. Continue to teach us through your word about who you are and what you've done. May we respond in humility, in obedience, and in wholehearted praise. For the sake of Christ, I ask these things. Amen. Well, did you hear them yesterday? I'm referring to the tornado sirens that always go off Saturday at noon. And uh, I would guess that a lot of you did not even hear them unless you were outside and you're fairly close to one of the sirens uh, because they're just blaring, they're, they're very loud. But we get so used to them that we hear them, but we don't really hear them. I doubt that that was the experience this past Wednesday. The folks in northern Texas and Oklahoma and on to the east where the outbreak of tornadoes, when they heard those, those sirens, they probably, because they knew something was coming, they probably ran for cover. And this morning's reading out of the book of Joel, chapter 2, I invite you to turn there with me. We're going to read several different parts of this passage. Uh, we'll only be dealing with verses 1 through 17. But there's an incredible um, message that is here that helps us to see the importance of listening, really listening, when that trumpet, that alarm sounds. Listen to the Word of God from Joel chapter 2. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, and as destruction from the Almighty it comes. The Lord utters His voice before His army, for His camp is exceedingly great. He who executes His word is powerful." Now, let me just go back and review and, and bring us into what's happening in chapter 2. The plague of locusts, and remember, in both chapter 1 and chapter 2, I am viewing this symbolic language as literal bugs, as I said last week, literal grasshoppers. So, this whole plague of locusts and everything that happened because of the plague of locusts was ultimately from God. I, I don't know if you picked that up on the verses that we read, and we did refer in one of those statements back to chapter 1, but they were ultimately from God. There was a purpose that they served. So let me bring that up to today. I would say that the coronavirus and everything that is happening because of it is ultimately from God. There is purpose. Paul reminds us of this in Romans chapter 11, verse 36, for from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be the glory forever. Amen. Now, most of you who are listening to this sermon have heard and you've studied Scripture and you know this. And what we've been saying over the past couple of weeks is simply what we have said over and over again, that God is God and that God is good, and parenthetically, we are not. And in reality, we have, or at least I have, I've stopped trying to defend God or make Him look better. You know, just a few minutes ago, Dennis read out of uh, 1 Samuel, uh, the story of Hannah and her, her heart cry to God, to, to hear her prayer. It just so happens that this past week, I started reading out of the book of 1 Samuel in my own personal quiet time. And I came to chapter 2, and, and I was struck by, by, by what Hannah was praying. And it's a picture of what I just said a few moments ago, that we're really not trying, we've stopped trying to defend God and what He is doing 
all around us. Listen to some of the, the words of this, and then I'll put something up on the screen in just a few moments. This is Hannah's prayer after, after she conceived and she knew she was going to have a child and bring that child to Eli. Chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, it says this, My heart, this is her prayer, exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. And we listen to this part of the prayer and we say a hearty amen. This is good stuff. But then we drop on down and in verses 6 and 7, she says, with equal force, with equal passion for God, the Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. She does it without explanation. She does it without apologizing for God. God is God and he is good. And he is using everything, not only in the prophecy of Joel, but also in our own day. Now, we heard this last week, but we come up to today and we see it uh, even, even more that Joel is a, let me put this word in here, it is a gracious wake-up call to believers because Joel is talking primarily, not exclusively, ex exclusively, but primarily to the people of God. So it's a wake-up call to believers for, we glean this from what it says here, from their half hearted worship from their half-hearted obedience. And all of us know, adults and children, you listen to this, that partial obedience is simply disobedience. So it's written to believers. It's written also to non-believers, those who out and out reject the call of God on their lives. Now here's the thing that we're going to discover in chapter 2, that the remedy for both believers and non-believers who are not walking according to the Lord is this. In a word, it's repent. When we see the plague of locusts that God sends on Judah, please remember something, Christian, and we need to sort this out and try to make it as clear as possible that this was for their discipline as children of God and not for their judgment. And I would bring this up to date and say, Christian, you can apply the same thing to us today. If you're a believer, the same thing goes for COVID-19. We know that as believers, all of our sins have been judged on Jesus Christ on the cross. Romans 8, verse 1, if you have not memorized this, I encourage you to do so. It's a wonderful affirmation of this truth. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But we are also told in the New Testament in a passage of Hebrews chapter 12, and you can read the whole thing, verses 6 through 11, but I'm just going to quote a little bit of it, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son, we could add, or daughter, whom he receives. You see, Hebrews, if, if you expand on that and read a little bit further, it's going to tell you that God's discipline is often painful rather than pleasant, but it also says it's for your good and mine. Because in the end, it yields, the writer of the Hebrews says it like this, talking about Christian maturity, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Well, let me talk to you children, or some of you adults who remember being children, and when you disobeyed and you were disciplined by your parents, and that discipline could have taken different forms. These are some things that you might be told by your parents or that you might have been told. Go to your room. You're grounded because of what you done, you've done. You won't be getting your allowance 
And, of course, the ultimate is you're going to get a spanking. Now, in all of those things, let me remind you children that it doesn't mean that your parents are disowning you. It proves, according to the writer of the Hebrews, to the Hebrews, it proves that you are their child and that they love you. And in a way, if we bring that up to the situation all around us today, could it be that the discipline of the Lord is upon us, Christian, in this whole pandemic? Could it be that the Lord has said, in a sense, Go to your room. You're grounded. You won't be getting your allowance. I'm going to give you a spanking. I, I came across this last week, and I thought it was great. I'm going to put it uh, up on, on the screen to show you uh, because I know that some of you can really relate to this. I know that there are uh, among my children, those who can relate to this. People are mad about not being able to go places, talking about the pandemic. Please. I was grounded about 90% of the time between the 7th and 12th grade. I trained for this. So I want to ask you, have you thought about the stay-at-home directive, perhaps, the economy, the pain that people are going through is God's discipline? Let me put it another way, God's trumpet, his wake-up alarm. Maybe it's nothing that we've done necessarily that's sinful, but maybe it's a wake-up call to repent for perhaps half-hearted worship or maybe just to help you grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's read another passage of Scripture because I've laid out for you the call, the call. And it gets even more specific in chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. I want to read this and uh, uh, listen to it well because this is going to be the wake-up call. We see the problem with Judah and we see the blessings, or at least they're going to be told to us on the other side of this. So what's in between? How do you get from th this place of devastation to the place of blessing. And beginning with chapter 2, verse 12, Joel tells us, Yet even now, declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning, and rend or tear your, gar your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord, he says again, your God. For he is gracious, look at his character, and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. It goes back to verse 1. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Now, I want you to watch this. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. So the remedy is what he calls returning to the Lord or what we would call today repentance. And that's for both the lost and the saved. Do, do you realize that there are only two groups of people who are listening to this message today? In fact, there are really only two groups of people in the entire world, the lost and the saved. Let me put it in the way that Joel will put it. The non-repenters and the repenters, and that is is why this teaching is so incredibly important. It is absolutely vital, and it's for everyone. This kind of study is kind of heavy. And so if you're listening there in the comfort of your own home and you've got your family gathered around you, um, sometimes you students and you children, even the younger children, you, you might be thinking in your mind, wow, repentance and all the rest of that, that's really for my mom and dad. 
No, Joel specifically says, gather everyone, gather everyone, the whole family. Students, this is for you. Children, if you're old enough to understand the concepts, and we're going to be defining repentance in just a moment, this is for you. Here's what I want you to know. No one, not your parents, not your grandparents, not your older brother or sister who are really walking with the Lord, no one can repent for you. You must repent for yourself. Here's another thing that we need to note. Sometimes we, th- we hear a word like this and we feel as if the, the, the only use of this kind of concept is in the Old Testament. Well, that, that, was, that was for the prophets. Let, let them talk about repentance. Absolutely not. This carries into the New Testament. John the Baptist came with a message of repentance. Repent from your sins. He said Jesus started his ministry and continued his ministry calling for repentance. And the apostle Paul and all of the other apostles also talked about repentance. Now, there are too many scriptures to list, but I want to do a couple of things and we're going to start looking at some different points and and, and begin to define so I, if if you want to take note, you can, but I want you to listen to these I want to talk, first of all, three things that show the importance of why repentance is necessary for you and me today. Here's the first one. Repentance is the only alternative to perishing. I said it a minute ago. There are only two groups of people in the world today, the lost and the saved. There is no middle ground. You're not just off the road and and, and waiting for a while. You're either on the road, the narrow road that leads to life, or the broad road that leads to destruction. And let me say it again, only repenters will be in heaven. Jesus was talking to a group of people in this passage in Luke 13, and, and there were two contemporary situations that had gone on. One involved the evil of, of man, and that there is a lot of evil of men going on, isn't there? The other involved what might be called a natural disaster. In one, Pilate had actually attacked a group of Galileans as they were worshiping. I want you to imagine that. It said that he mingled their blood with the blood of the sacrifice. And then the other situation where there was a tire. A, a, a tower, the t- a tower of Siloam, and it fell over. We don't know what caused it, but it fell over and killed some people. And in both cases, Jesus used these situations as an opportunity to say, look, just because you escaped that fate today doesn't mean that you're not going to someday die. And I'm going to tell you something. There is a fate worse than physical death that these men experience. Don't think you're better because you didn't die. But I tell you, he said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. There are only two groups of people, the lost and the saved, the repenters and the non-repenters. Second thing about repentance, it is the only gospel authorized by Jesus. You know, for years I've looked at different gospel presentations and tracts and things like that, and I've heard a number of different sermons, and basically one of the elements, and I wonder who is behind this, if not our enemy, one of the elements that is often left out, often, not always, but often left out, is repentance. But if you see what the risen Lord Jesus did in one of the statements of the Great Commission, he said that in order to preach the gospel, you've got to have repentance. He said to them, all of his disciples, as he's commissioning them to go out, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. And so if we go out with any kind of a gospel message, where whether sharing one-on-one or in a small group or at a church, and our message does not include repentance, 
we have preached an incomplete gospel. It is not the gospel. Repentance is the only alternative to perishing. It's the only gospel authorized by Jesus. But folks, and, and this goes back to some of the themes that I've already been trying to, to show you, it is the only way to prepare for the day of the Lord. I, I have heard people say that, that espouse a certain kind of eschatology, that repentance was relegated to the Old Testament. And the reason that you see it in John the Baptist or you see it in Jesus was because that was before the day of Pentecost and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Folks, that is absolutely wrong. The Apostle Paul, the, the Apostle to the Gentiles, preached to Jews and also to Greeks or to Gentiles. And his message was consistent. Acts 17, verses 30 and 31, when he was preaching in Athens to a group of Greeks, hardened pagans, what was his message? He didn't try to sweeten things up. As part of his message, he said, now he, God, commands all people everywhere to repent. And here's the reason why, because he has fixed a day, the day of the Lord, in which he will come to judge the world in righteousness. Just like in Joel, he sounds the alarm. He commands all men everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day in which people will be called to account. Have you repented? Are you repenting? Have you turned to God with your whole self? I'm not saying are you following perfectly, but just as Joel says, with all your heart. Are you as a Christian continuing to walk in repentance? Are you a, as one person has said, a repenting repenter? Now, let's look at a definition We've talked about a lot of things, but I want to give you a definition from a, a man that, that I have admired through the years, um, Arthur W. Pink. But before I give that definition, I, I want to just talk about a couple of things. Repentance is not mechanical, okay? It's all your heart. We say this over and over again. Repentance and faith are always a heart thing. Joel gets in on it. He says, instead of tearing your clothes, that's a mechanical thing. It could reflect your heart, but not necessarily. But what I really want you to do, God says, is to tear your heart, be contrite in your heart. You see, salvation is when God takes rebel sinners and he changes them, he turns them into loyal sons and daughters and subjects of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this might be a new revelation to you when I said to you a minute ago, Christian, that you are to continue to repent. Some will say, well, no, wait, wait, that's how we get in, that's how we get in the front door. Are you saying I need to, to, to continually repent as a Christian? Well, let me ask you a question, and we'll see a little bit more about this in just a second. But do you as a Christian ask God to help you grow in faith? And you're sitting there and you're saying, well, absolutely I do. Well, then why not ask the Lord to help you grow in repentance? Do you know why? Because there is an inseparable, inseparable connection between repentance and faith. It's like two sides of the same coin. You never have one without the other. Paul would say it later to a group of leaders in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. He said that I, I have not shirked from telling you everything that you needed to know. And then he goes on to say this, testifying to both, here it is again, Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know of any single scripture that shows the combination of repentance and faith as much as clearly as that does. Now, for those of you who have been in our Membership Matters class, I walk 
people who are taking a look at us, who are interested in thinking about becoming a member of our class. And one of the main things that I do is walk people through a, a gospel presentation because we don't want to take anything for granted. We don't want to assume anything about anyone. They need to hear the gospel and be able to respond to it. But when I come to talking about repentance and faith, I, I have often illustrated it like this. I hope this will be helpful to you. And it basically goes along with that scripture, that repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. If I were to ask you how you receive the gift of salvation, if, if God is right here and he's offering it to me, let's just say me, how should I receive it? And you would say, well, you just reach out and take it, right? But there's a problem biblically because Romans chapter 3 says and I'm going to do something that all of us have turned aside we have each gone our own way so can I receive the gift of God for salvation the first thing I must do is repent I must turn away from my sins and turn and by faith in our Lord Jesus Christ receive the gift of salvation. Repenting is the turning part of conversion, of salvation. Now let's look at a definition. Arthur W. Pink, a man who lived eight, late 1800s, early 1900s, who uh, wrote, and he wrote deeply. You're going to see this from this definition. Here's what he defined biblical repentance as. True biblical repentance is a supernatural and inward revelation from God, giving a deep consciousness of what I am in His sight, which causes me to loathe and condemn myself, resulting in a bitter sorrow for sin, a holy horror and hatred for sin, and a turning away from or forsaking of sin. Now, that's not only wordy, that's challenging. I, I would guess that even as I read through that, that there would be some people who would hear it, probably not you, but there would be some people and say, ooh, ooh, that, that sounds a little bit opposed to the common teaching that we have today in terms of the gospel of self-esteem, and you would be right. So let's break it down. We're going to go through five different phrases of this and show some scriptural support for each one of these. First one is this, the first phrase, true biblical repentance is a supernatural and inward revelation from God. Repentance is not natural to us in our fallen condition. And another corrective, repentance is not just having a guilty conscience, a sensitive conscience. There are tons of people with a sensitive conscience who've never really repented toward God. It has to be given by the Holy Spirit. It is Holy Spirit revealed. Here's a question for you. On the day of Pentecost, Peter's first sermon right out of the chute, and he preaches to thousands of people, and literally, I don't know how long his sermon was, but from the beginning of his sermon to the end of it, there was such an incredible turnaround an incredible change. And by the way, if you go back and read Peter's sermon, his first sermon, it was a healthy dose of an exposition of the prophet Joel. So how did people change from being mockers to becoming passionate followers? Because the Holy Spirit gave them repentance. Repentance is just like faith. If they're the two sides of the same coin. Repentance is just like faith. They are both grace gifts. They are gifts from God. Luke 15 tells us the story of the prodigal son. And just a phrase there says that when he came to the end of himself, look at this, when he came to himself. Now, it doesn't say it specifically here, but there was a revelation from God. We see it specifically in Acts chapter 11 in verse 18, after Peter had preached to Cornelius and he, he was called before the council, he was giving a report 
And he told them what had happened. These Gentiles, these non-Jewish people had heard the gospel and, and they had repented and believed in Jesus Christ and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here was the assessment of the apostles. They glorified God and said, then to the Gentiles also, as well as the Jews, God has granted, look at this, repented. He has given as a grace gift repentance that leads to life. Now, now I want to make this very personal. If you're sitting there and you've thought to yourself, well, you know, when I was younger, I walked an aisle. I um, uh, took the preacher by the hand. I talked to a Sunday school teacher. Uh, but I don't know that I ever repented. How do I do that? First thing you do is you call out to God. Cry out to God. If you would ask for faith, then ask for repentance. But we must move on. Not only is true biblical repentance a supernatural inward revelation from God, go to the second phrase, giving a deep consciousness of what I am in His sight, in God's sight. Now, this is a couple of things that this is not. It's not merely a, a fear of punishment. This is not a uh-oh, I got caught. And it's also not a desire for blessing and so I'm going to repent. Listen, sin is not something that we do only. It is something that we are. Let me give you a couple of pictures of that. First, the, the prodigal son story again in Luke 15. The son said to him, to his father, Father, I have sinned, watch this, against heaven and before you. This deep consciousness of what he was before heaven, before God, even before his father. And then a stunning picture out of David's life in Psalm 51. When he was caught after a year of rebelling, of rejecting the overtures of the Holy Spirit, remaining in his sin of adultery and murder and lying, it caught up to him. And he said one of the most amazing things in this little passage of Scripture in Psalm 51, he said this to God, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. How could David say that? Had he not sinned against Uriah, against Bathsheba, against the son who was born, against the whole tribe of nation of Israel? Yes, but he saw his sin first of all as an affront to the holy God. And then he goes on, and, and this is so stunning in its implication. He said, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. That's the very next verse. And in sin did my mother conceive me. I want you to hear what David is saying. He is not passing blame, but he's going back to the very beginning. He said, I did what I did at the age of 50. That's about how old he was. The adultery, the lust, the rebellion, the murder, the lying, all of the rest of that. I did what I did when I was 50 because of what I was at birth. Repentance brings a deep consciousness of what I am in God's sight. A third phrase out of, out of the de definition by A.W. Pink, which causes me, this is going to be the most uh, challenging for a lot of people. Again, not in our congregation, but a lot of people would be very challenged by this. They would say, how dare you? But he says, which causes us, this genuine biblical repentance, which causes me to loathe and condemn myself. You talk about striking at the heart of the so-called gospel of self-esteem. Again, the prodigal son in Luke 15, 21, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Well, frankly, he was never worthy. But through a divine revelation, he realized I am not worthy to be called your son. Now, now, if you go on, it's not printed for you here, but you go on, make me as one of your slaves. That young man loathed and condemned himself for what he had done to his God and to his Father. And I think of another picture, another word picture, illustration. Luke chapter 18 and verse 13. 
tells the story of a tax collector and a Pharisee and the marked difference in the way that they responded when they went up to the temple to worship. Listen to the heart of the tax collector. But the tax collector beat his breast. He was not just tearing his coat, he was tearing his heart saying, God, be merciful to me. And how did he define himself? A sinner. Repentance had entered into this man's experience and he loathed and condemned himself. In other words, it is good to own our guilt and accept the condemnation of our sins and ourselves because by nature we love our sin and we excuse our sin. So growing out of that, a fourth phrase resulting in a bitter sorrow for sin, a holy horror and hatred for sin. I could think of no better example than the Apostle Paul, who is a believer in Romans 7. And he talks about the struggle and his sincere hatred for the sin that still trips him up. He said, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. You know, true repentance always leads to a bitter sorrow for sin, a holy horror and a hatred for sin. I go back to, to, to Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost and these people, all of this crowd that was listening, when he came down to his closing argument, it doesn't just say that they ask him what they should do because he's going to tell them to repent. It says first, they were cut to the heart. And that has to happen. To one degree or another, that has to happen. One of the things in writing about the Sermon on the Day of Pentecost and really expanding it to everyone, Charles Spurgeon said, it is idle to attempt to heal those who are not wounded, to attempt to clothe those who have never been stripped, and to make those rich who have never realized their poverty. The last thing in this definition by Arthur W. Pink, a turning away from or forsaking of sin. We see an example of this, many examples of this over and over again in Scripture. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul is, is speaking in his opening remarks to the church at Thessalonica, and he says this. He said, you did this. You went through all of this situation, all of this definition. You had true repentance because you turned to God from idols to serve a living and a true God. Joel starts out by saying, Blow a trumpet, sound an alarm, for the day of the Lord is near, and it is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Yesterday, Saturday at noon, the sirens went off. They were largely ignored because there were not really any threats in the sky, but someday, Someday there will be a trumpet that sounds. The divine shofar will sound. And folks, it is nearer today than it was yesterday. The question from Joel is, who can endure it? But I would add another question, who can escape it? There is no ignoring. A minute ago, I spoke to, to all levels of people who are listening to this message today. Assemble all of them, the elders, the children, the infants, people in every season and station of life. So adults, children, students, each of you needs to hear this. Again, your parents or your grandparents cannot repent and believe for you. And if you sense after hearing your pastor talk about this today, and you don't sense any deep conviction of the things, then just get by yourself later on today and, and pray. Call out to God. 
say, God, grant me repentance, the desire to turn away from my sin, the desire to turn away from from fighting against you, from playing like I'm my own God. But that's not enough. Help me to trust in, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to not depend upon myself, my own self-sufficiency, but to to completely depend upon him. Someday when that last trumpet sounds, each one of us and all of the world will stand before the Lord and give an account. The question out of today's message is this, will you stand before him as a repenter? Christian, let me say it again like this, as a repenting repenter. Has your repentance grown today from this past week? Has your faith grown today from this last week? Only those who have repented will endure that day. You will meet him either as a wonderful Savior, and by the way, if you do not, if you meet him that day as a judge, then it will be too late to meet him as a merciful Savior. I hear these days a lot of calls for church and national revival. That's good. But we must get first things first. The book of Joel calls his people, individuals, and the nation to repent. There can be no revival unless there is first repentance. And I think of the New Testament which, in which the Lord Jesus later on in the book of Revelation speaks to individual churches and in those churches where they have grown lukewarm toward the things of God or they've fallen into idolatry or they've run to sexual immorality, what is the remedy in all of those churches? Repent, come back to me, do the things that you did at first, Christian. And even in in spite of the fact that they had done good things, the Lord often commends them for good things, they had fallen into patterns that were destructive. And they needed to repent, as the Lord Jesus said to them. Let me say one more thing. Nations, too, need to repent. I think of the nation of Nineveh when Jonah was sent to them with one message for that entire nation, repent. But folks, they couldn't or we can't repent as a nation. It is everyone involved from the king putting on sackcloth and fasting all the way down to the lowest of the people. Individuals who are repenting and turning back to God. I want to pray for you And after that, Jonathan will sing, and then we will be dismissed. Father, I thank you and praise you for the book of Joel in in the Bible to teach us. And and we think of the the New Testament uh, admonitions to go back and to learn things from the Old Testament prophets, and that's what we're seeking to do. So today we've learned a little bit more about the biblical doctrine of repentance. And I pray that you would help those who are listening and who have never truly repented. I pray that today you would grant them that grace gift along with the grace gift of faith. And today would be the day of salvation in which they would become members of your family. I pray for those of us who know you, Lord, we have not arrived. We have not achieved perfection yet, and so we need to continue to grow in repentance and faith. Help us every day to learn a little bit more how to hate the things that you hate and love the things you love. And we will give you glory and honor and praise. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. i
His mercies for sins that are known and those unknown. We call on Your name so holy for envy and pride, for closing our eyes, for scorning our very neighbor. In thought, word, and deed, we failed You, our King. How deeply we need a Savior. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord. Before uh, I give the benediction, which is a blessing as we wrap up our time of worship here today, uh, let me say a word about the events of the last couple of days. You should have received by now information concerning Governor Stitt's reopening of businesses and churches. Um, I'm not going to repeat everything that I said in that communication but would like to say that we're excited about the possibilities of being together again. Now, that being said, we need to remember something. That we will come back together is certain, barring the return of the Lord Jesus, of course. The question at this point is the who and the when and the how. I want to assure you that our elders, that our pastoral staff has already been meeting, and we will be evaluating the mountain, that's the way we feel about it, the mountain of information, and doing our best to come up with a plan for reopening our church that is prayerful, that is biblically informed, that is consistent with government guidelines, and that is best for the whole church family. So with all of that in mind, we will not be meeting in the church facilities this next Sunday, May the 3rd. We will continue that Sunday with our online service, and I hope that you will be a part of that. And we will let you know our next steps just as quickly as we can determine what those steps are. I want to say on behalf of the elders and the staff that we appreciate you. We appreciate your patience and your understanding as we seek under God the best path for heritage. And we cover your prayers for God's wisdom. Now, the benediction. Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. God bless you.